This video starts with an unexpected evening car ride. I put in an offer for two auctions on the place that addicts would refer to as their dealer, the Dutch version of eBay. I was on my way to pick up two nice XT class computers. This video will be about one of them. So here it is. It is, as you can see, a bit grimy. This is a Laser Turbo XT. The intriguing part about this machine and one of the main factors that I wanted to add it to my collection, aside from the fact that it's a vintage computer, of course, is the sheer number of drives. It has, well, it appears to have two hard drives and two disk drives. Sheer numbers may be a bit over-exaggerated looking at the fact that it doesn't fit more drives. Also, the computer had, for as far as I could see in the auction, all its slots filled. We will take a look at backside a bit later, but first we need to give this computer a bit of a clean. I'm not quite sure what the smushy substance was, but I think it might have been a sort of glue-based paint. The spots seem too thick for tape residue. On the side of the case was actual sticker residue that took some persuading to get off, but after some scrubbing removed quite nicely. On the front panel were these spots that were very tough to remove. I'd used up all my magic erasers with another computer earlier, so let's see if they will work later this video when I restock on them. I wonder if the logo is sort of painted on, since on my other laser computers I also noticed that it's a different type of plastic, probably a sort of badge. The computer was stacked on top of another, I think, since there was also some sticky stuff on the bottom. Before we open the case, let's take a better look at the Turbo XT. So here's the 5.25 inch drive, and the 3.5 inch drive, and the two hard drives, drive C and D. It has a tubular lock, which is common on this era of systems, a light for power and high speed mode. If we take a look at the back, we see that it has a lot of expansions. A game port and a parallel port, the hard disk card, an RS-232 card, to another game and parallel card, the video card with a bunch of outputs and a card for a scanner. I believe I have one of those scanners, so it would be nice to try it out with this computer. All these expansions and sort of network functions make me wonder if this machine was used as a sort of server. Oh, and it also has a weird red switch. So pretty nice machine that we will be testing now. Let's first open up the case. This is one of the few computers of this type that has all its screws still. I find that most of these machines will lose some of their screws in their lifetime. Heck, I find myself even losing the screws on my computers all the time. So imagine back in the day someone upgrading their computer and losing some screws along the way. The first thing I see is that one of the connectors is disconnected and that some of the pins are bent. So it appears that that connector is connecting the two hard drives to the controller card. Also, one of the disk drives is not connected. Let's plug it back in. I bent back the pins with some pliers, which was quite easy to do. And plug the connector back in. The sticker on the G drive worries me about its state. It has a whole bunch of bad sectors, if I'm reading the sticker correctly. Let's do a smoke test. I want to try the CGA card with this CGA to SCART adapter. This is a nifty device and it works quite nicely. I haven't come across a decent color monitor with the DB9 connector yet. The SCART cable I will connect to my open source scan converter. The power supply powers on nicely. Not a lot was happening at first, but then the C drive light started flashing followed by the D light. The RAM was tested by the BIOS and then I got a blinking cursor for about a minute. That was followed by this message that is quite familiar to most people. Non-system disk or disk error. The drives did not spin up or flash their lights. Try putting in this MS-DOS disk that I had lying around. Interestingly, it is closely related to the other computer I picked up. The same sequence as the first followed. No response from the 5.25 drive, sadly. I swapped over the cables, because they appear to be wrongly connected. I noticed that the drive spun up when I opened and closed the mechanism. A good starting point for troubleshooting, I thought, would be to take a look at the disk drive controller. It was a good first step, I got to say. I removed these two brackets with connectors, then I moved on to the disk drive card. It was a bit stubborn, as I find with most old PC cards, so I got a dull screwdriver and tried to pop it out with that, which it did. 
And I immediately saw an issue that needed resolving. Well, two issues that needed resolving. First off, this edge connector is very dirty on both sides. But also I found a 9 volt battery was connected to the PCB, which already started to leak a bit. I looked around on the motherboard but could not locate it. The battery was apparently hiding behind one of the drives. Let's desolder it. Desoldering with this special iron is very easy, but this battery was quite stubborn. I cut it away with some pliers and desoldered the leftover pins. Then I started scrubbing away the dirtiness on the PCB. It looks like we caught this in time and that the damage can be cleaned away. Here's that battery by the way. Then I moved on to the connector, which I scrubbed with the brush and went over with some contact cleaner. It's clear that this connector is also dirty. I brushed it with some alcohol and it also appeared to be a bit loose, but when I later checked it, it seemed fine. also drained this part of the motherboard in contact cleaner. I plugged the controller into another slot and tested the system again. Lo and behold, a functioning disk drive. Yes, only one at this moment. But then something went not as I hoped it would go. Turns out that this Philips disk is quite something. When you put it in, it will automatically start formatting the C drive. I had not yet seen that on a disk before. Sort of panicked, hoping to recover some data of the C drive or see in the installer what partitions were discovered, I turned off the computer. I moved on to an Ericsson disk, which also was complaining that it wasn't an Ericsson computer. Then I realized that I had the perfect disk laying around for this system. Although I worried that that Philips disk had made it impossible to see if there were any files on the C or D drives. These are genuine laser disks. I got these from the Dutch version of eBay for my Laser 286 system that I did a video on earlier. Let's put it in the system. Well, I ran the installer three times. It was quite a generic version of DOS. I always enjoy installing DOS for some reason, don't quite know why. But then after it gave an error, I still had the feeling some part of it got installed to the C drive. And I was right, the C drive booted very nicely into DOS, version 4.01. Well, a working 5.25 inch drive is enough to start testing the system with some software, I think. Coincidence has it that I just got in a shipment of fresh discs. This is in the top 3 of most interestingly packed shipments from the Dutch version of eBay, I think, together there with a used pizza box. This batch was very cheap and looking at some of the titles it's quite interesting. Of course it has the usual word perfect discs, but it also came with more interesting titles like this Panopsic, which I know nothing about. Quickly looking through all the discs to see if I can find other interesting stuff. Nice verbatim box. Interesting Philips disc. In this pile were some Amstrad discs, IBM DOS, some compact disc and something I'm very happy with, this CPN 2.00 disc. I don't have a lot of CPM discs and would kinda like to see what CPM is like, so this will come in handy. Let's get some discs boxes and take them to the laser. This disc says HBASIC on the label. Going to the HBASIC directory, starting up HBASIC and getting this funky screen. Anyone know what HBASIC is for? The text on this label I couldn't quite make out. Let's see what's in the directory. A whole bunch of file types, POS and BUC files, I have not yet seen before. A quick Google search comes up with POS being a POS call file and BUC could be used for a backup file. I tried to open by just typing some of the file names, but that did not work. So I moved on to the next disk. Mm -hmm. 
Again, the same sort of file types, this time adding a PIC file and a CPT file, both probably for a sort of graphic file. Interesting, when I typed in vf.x, I got a program running showing all the files on the disks. I randomly opened some of the files and got various results. As a retro amateur, I'm not quite sure what would be practical use for this. I expected the other disks to also contain similar files, so I checked the stack if there would be anything else interesting. A bunch of word perfect disks. Let's try this write it disk. I expect that typing W, I will load it. And there it is. Professional word processor version 3.3, copyright 1984. Let's see if we can make a quick document. Then I had to fill in some more info. And then a very weird screen popped up. Modify document defaults. Allow widows and orphans? Huh? I guess so. Let's allow them. For the rest, it's quite a normal and nice word processor. I love software like this. By the way, looking at Wikipedia teaches me that in typesetting, widows and orphans are lines of text that dangle at the beginning and the end of a block of text, either at the head or at the foot of a page or of a column of text. Moving on to this WordStar disk, this got to be the most exciting test of a computer you have seen yet, with me testing multiple word processors. Got to say that I highly enjoyed these, but I can imagine that you are thinking maybe try a game or something. That's why I put it in the thumbnail, more as a warning than a unique selling point. WordStar is as I would have expected it to be. I typed some limes and moved on to this disk that appears to have been a gift of some type. And here is the first game I try. Dragons. Lovely time pitch, which I'm not sure how to play it. It has an elaborate story at the beginning and a nice dragons begin screen. I will have to check the controls more carefully would I want to play it. This, this was also a bit of a mystery to me. It had the name Musimp written on it. I had some trouble typing that but eventually it loaded. Saying MS-DOS version, copyright 1982, licensed by Microsoft. No clue, but looking online it appears to be some kind of programming language you can use with or for math. I think that these discs were probably owned by some programmer or something. I tried some stuff to see what would happen, but I came up empty handed. I wanted to try another box like this one with Sony discs, but I suspect that these discs are for the Amiga. I got some more magic erasers and tried to clean away the black spots on the front bezel. I'm not sure if this is any fun, but I have a whole bunch more discs that we can try in a future video. The Laser Turbo XT will definitely return for a second video, because I need to fix a few more things for it. For instance, the 3.5 inch drive still needs sorting out. Also the C drive filled again, I think, because I might have disconnected it to test the D drive uh, again. So I want to try to add either a CF to IDE, because I think I've seen a connector for that in it. Need to double check that. Would be nice to have it accessible via the back. Or I will attempt to put in an XT to CF. I have a couple of those I want to put in some of my systems. Also we need to see what that red switch is for, because I forgot. And let's see if we can add some sound. Oh yeah, and maybe if we get the chance we can add some more RAM. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.